Hello and welcome back. In this video we're going to begin uh, flipping the hood on one of the most fundamental of biomathematics processes, namely sequence alignment. Now uh, before we roll up our sleeves and get our hands on these methods we have some important foundations to cover. We'll focus here on the why, the what and the how of sequence alignment. We'll begin with the why, that is why do we actually care about comparing biological sequences in the first place? That's a good question to ask at the start of all these uh, video lectures that we have. For the what, it's very useful to take a step back and consider you know, what are alignments at their core trying to convey. Now for homologous sequences where alignments are actually most useful, I'll show you how alignments are actually trying to capture and display in a succinct way, the sequence of changes that happened uh, during their descent from a common ancestor. And we'll discuss uh, what these terms mean, particularly these matches, mismatches and gaps in those sorts of uh, contexts, in that capturing the descent from a common ancestor context. And then finally, what we'll do is we'll spend the lion's share of our time here, we'll actually go flip the hood and see how these uh, methods work and see how we can get a computer to start calculating these things for us. We'll actually build up our mental model and our understanding as we go through, starting from some more simple approaches, these dot plot kind of approaches, and then progress to more complicated ones uh, that build on these simple approaches uh, and that will expand and then subsequently uh, delve into deeper in subsequent uh, videos. Okay, so let's get started with uh, the why of comparing biological sequences. Now, now, before that, really, the basic idea, it's a, it's a pretty simple one. It's that we want to display a pair of uh, sequences here, one above the other with spaces that we term gaps, inserted into both to reveal the similarity of the actual characters, whether those characters are nucleotides or amino acids in the case of proteins. So if we consider these two short nucleotide sequence examples here, and I'm calling them seq1 and seq2, we can consider two types of character correspondence. A match, where the two characters are actually the same, and a mismatch, where they uh, differ. Well, now with alignments, what we can do is add these uh, dash characters here. We would, we would use spaces, but no one can see the white space. So we add these dashes and we call them gap characters. And we add it to one or both sequences to try and increase those numbers of matches that we see, those blue vertical lines indicating the identical characters in sequence one and sequence two. Those are the matches. Uh, now, if we consider the alignment that we're showing here as reflecting the kind of evolutionary history of these two sequences, as we'll discuss in a moment, these mismatches, what they represent are substitutions, also known as mutations. That is where one character is actually changed into another, right? They're not the same character, they're not identical. And these gaps where we put the dashes, they represent either insertions or deletions. So that is in the first sequence here, the, the A that was, uh, was deleted from sequence two relative to sequence one. And that C in sequence two, if you see it here, that was inserted in sequence two relative to sequence one. Now, I'm implying some sort of order that it's in this sequence or this sequence. Of course, we don't have actually a time machine and therefore we don't know which way around it happens. You know, was it an insertion in this sequence or a deletion in the other sequence? So we, what we do is, you know, we think we're smart and we come up with a new word called indels. That's just a combination of the start of the word insertion and the start of the word deletion. And that kind of covers our asses and we call them indels, right? Because we don't know whether it's really an insertion or a deletion in the sequence we're talking about at a given time. So we just call them indels. So why do we want to compare sequences in this way? Well, we want to obtain functional or, or mechanistic insight about a sequence by inference from another sequence that's potentially better characterized. So that's the case, for example, when we start with some unknown thing that we find in the lab or something like that, some unknown sequence or something we've got from a sequence in run. And we say, well, what could this be possibly doing in this disease we're interested in? Or why is this drug affecting this, this uh, biomolecule, for example, this, this, this protein product or whatever it is? And we can search a database of well-annotated sequences where we know what those sequences are 
and find a match. And then we can say, well, this is similar to that sequence and it's potentially doing similar things, some similar functions or similar activities. So we'll be able to kind of share the wealth, share that annotation across sequence space by finding relatives by these kinds of methods. And we'll do a lot of this in the subsequent uh, section of this course. Another, of course, is to find, uh, another motivation is to find whether two or more genes or proteins or any other biomolecules are kind of evolutionarily related. So this uh, kind of alignment view that's trying to capture these evolutionary changes, as we'll discuss, is very important in the field of phylogenetics, for example, that tries to study the evolutionary relationships of these biomolecules. And then another motivation is to find functionally or structurally similar uh, regions, that's subregions within sequences. So this not might be the might not be the entirety of the of the two sequences that we're that we're uh, considering here. It doesn't have to be their entire length, but maybe a small fraction, like a motif region, that could be indicative if it's a nucleotide, maybe a transcription factor binding site or some kind of important regulatory site that binds with some other biomolecule. If it's a protein, this could be the, the characteristic functional site, like the catalytic site, the thing that does the chemistry or the biochemistry in these molecules, these conserved regions. And by finding these kind of subregions, we can infer, again, functional insight from that knowledge. And then finally here, there's just many, many practical biofmax applications that depend on this kind of alignment approach. For example, they include things like similar research in databases, protein structure prediction, annotation, etc. The assembly of sequence reads into larger uh, constructs such as genome sequencing. Pretty much, actually, all next generation sequencing, including you know, resequencing, looking for differences and variants uh, and SNPs and things like this, insertions and deletions that we often look for, mapping of transcription factor bind sites via chip seek. Uh, pretty much all next generation sequence analysis depends on alignment, comparing your, for example, your reads that you get off these machines, these small fragments of sequence, back to some reference uh, sequence to put them in context. Okay, So it, in essence, it's a really important method. These pairwise sequence methods, you know, that's the key point here, is that they're, uh, they underpin a huge amount of bioinformatics. Right? It's arguably as I'm saying here in the, in, the, in the image, it's the most fundamental operation of all of bioinformatics. It's like our, uh, our hydrogen atom in terms of uh, bioinformatics. So it's a pretty important place to look under the hood and start our exploration of how we can get computers to do useful stuff for us. How can we get them to make and compute these kind of alignments? So let's move on now to the what question. So returning to fundamentals here for a moment, uh, there are three major types of sequence change that can occur during evolution. There's mutations, also called uh, substitutions. That's where we change one character into another. And then there's the deletions. And then there's the insertions. So that's when you remove or you insert uh, characters, amino acids or nucleotides in our case. So if we go back to our example of two homologous sequences that share a common answer sequence, I'm showing the common ancestor sequence here that's I'm labeling it uh, C in this in this image then uh, we have two modern sequences A and B that are descended from this common ancestor over time so time increases here to give us these recent sequences A and, and B here so what we're going to do is consider the sequence changes from that common ancestor that uh, allowed us to arrive at these recent species sequences A and B. So first, uh, we can envisage that a mutation event happened that changed this T to an A here at the second position in the ancestor sequence. Now we can postulate that this happened prior to the speciation, that split event that we see here, because it's an A in both these descendant sequences, A and B, right? You see that A is present in both of them, so it probably happened before the split. Now let's follow one of these branches and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, of course here we have to bear in mind now that we have two uh, 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 sequences now, right? The split, the speciation split. So these two sequences can accumulate these three types of different sequence changes, mutations, deletions, insertions now independently in these two branches as we go further down 
here, um, I'll progress further in time on this figure. So in this sequence here, uh, sequence A that we called, we have a deletion that happened that removed this G character from the fourth position. So that arrived at this sequence, and then we had an insertion uh, of a G to this new position, giving rise to the modern day sequence A. Okay, so let's uh, examine that again for a minute. So to summarize, starting from the, the top there from the answer to sequence, we have first had that red mutation, the T to an A, then we had a deletion event that's shown in pink here, and then finally we had our blue insertion event that got us to our modern day sequence. So let's go over to uh, sequence B here, and after that uh, first mutation that we already discussed previously prior to the speciation event, all we need to do is really have another mutation of this third C in this sequence to a T to arrive at our modern day sequence at the bottom. So in total, as I'm showing here, we only had two mutations from the ancestor to give rise to this recent sequence. Now, what alignments are trying to do is to visualize this uh, sequence similarity and these three types of evolutionary changes. So this alignment view that I'm showing here, colored up, it, we're comparing both sequence A and B by stacking the two sequences, one on top of the other, and accommodating these insertions and deletions with these gap characters. Those are the indels shown here. And then we have, we can actually just look and we can see which of the positions in the two sequences match or do not match, those not matching ones. Those are our mismatches, our substitutions, or our mutations. Here, remember that C that got mutated to a T here in these, in these cases. So this alignment view, what it does is it shows five matches, one mismatch, one insertion, and one deletion, or more simply, the two gaps. So we have five matches, one mismatch, and two gaps. We're just counting them up. Now, unfortunately, finding the correct alignment is difficult if we don't know the evolutionary history of the two sequences, like the two we just walked through a moment ago, because there are many possible arrangements of these characters in relation to themselves. That is, there are many possible alignments. So my question to you then is, of these three uh, possible alignments that are shown here, which is your favorite? Which alignment do you like best? So let's have a think for a minute. So we've got these three possible alignments. Now, one way to judge alignments is to compare their number of these three types of sequence changes, the matches, which I'm showing in green, the uh, insertions and deletions, those are the white ones. And of course, we can also consider the mismatches, what I'm showing in, in orange here. So we can count these up and again, you know, counting them up, this really, again, comes down to, you know, which one do you like best? Which of these character types or these correspondence types, the green or the orange or the white, do you like best? Okay. So any further ideas? Which one do you like best? Well, maybe, you know, you're patriotic like me. Maybe you like green a lot, right? You're Irish and you, you uh, like St. Patrick's Day and you, you like the green here. So maybe you like this middle one because it's got the most number of matches. Or maybe you're from a different part of Ireland and you like orange better than green and maybe you like the alignment one here. You know, orange is a nice, bright, happy color and there's more orange in this one. It's also more compact, right? It's not as spread out, if you, uh, if you will, as the other two. Maybe you prefer, prefer the alignment one in this case, right? There's no gaps. Maybe you really just don't like gaps. You don't like the white, right? White's kind of dull and boring, right? We don't like white, and the other two have white, so maybe you prefer the first one, right? Now, because we're a bit nerdy, uh, and you'll see we're actually a lot nerdy uh, uh, as we go through through the rest of the course, we can assign a score to each uh, type of color here. Now, as I said, I like green, so I'm going to pick a score here at random. I'm going to say plus three, because I like green, right? And orange is kind of bright and cheerful. I like it, but not as much as green, so I'm going to say plus one. And I really don't like white. I don't like the gaps, so I'm going to say uh, minus one here. 
Now, what I mean, of course, isn't you know my color preference. What I'm thinking here is that, you know, in what I know about biology or indels or these insertions and deletions, they're going to be more costly and potentially more disruptive to function and everything else during the course of evolution. So I'm giving them a worse score, right? But in essence, it still comes down to this picking numbers at random and we'll arrive at some answer if we just sum them up. So for example, in the first sequence here, we had four of these uh, match characters and we're saying plus three. And then we had three of the, of the mismatches. So we're using one for those. So we just sum it all up and we get a value of 15. Now you can see in the second sequence here, we have a value of 16. And in the third sequence, we have a value of 14. So the middle one here is our answer. And as biologists, we often arrive at solutions like this because we prefer these type of alignments like this one in the middle here highlighted where the number of postulated sequence changes is minimized. Right? This uh, is indeed the one that comes up highest with these scores that I you know, picked at random and it's kind of self-fulfilling. I picked the scores to find the alignment that I like best and it came up as the alignment that's best, right? Now, consider for a moment this position that I've just highlighted, this T in this middle best alignment that we're calling it, this optimal alignment, if you will. If I slide that T over to this position, what happens? Let me do that again. You see that animation, that T sliding across back and forth. What happens to our score in these two alternative alignments? These are two different answers, right? Is that going to change our score? Well, no, it's not. You know, we still have the same number of matches and gaps in this alignment. So the score is going to be the same. We can't actually tell these two alignments apart. Now, this is a small kind of trivial example, but this is replicated all the time as we get to more complicated things. We cannot unambiguously say which is the best alignment here. We can't tell them apart. So there's an important warning here. There may be more than one optimal alignment and we can't tell them apart. We mean optimal alignment because we mean it's the best score. That's the optimal score for whatever numbers we chose. And then in the second part of this warning here, I'm saying they may not reflect the true evolutionary history of these sequences. Okay. So what do we mean there? Well, when we considered those three answers underneath, Probably nobody picked the correct one. That's the third one. I showed you just a moment ago, for example, we walked through the whole trajectory at some length here of the changes that took us from our homologous sequence that these two modern sequences are descended from. And we walked through all the sequence changes and showed you how an alignment views that with the five matches, the one mismatch and the two gaps in this case. That was the third answer here. And nobody probably picked that. Certainly, when I do this in class, no one really picks that alignment. So again, this is an important point that maybe more than one optimal alignment, that's one more than one highest scoring alignment answer, and they don't even have to be correct. They don't have to reflect the true evolutionary history of our sequences. Bummer, huh? How do we deal with this? Well, we'll find out in a moment or two. It's time to move on to the how question. What we actually mean here is how do we actually compute the optimal alignment between two sequences? Now, given the time here, what I'm going to say is this is going to be the subject of our next video in the series. So let's uh, pause here and we'll rejoin in our next uh, episode. Thank you.